Our next speaker is Will Zilla from Hebrew University as well. Uh, preliminary conjectures, uh, basic conjectures and prelim preliminary results in non commutative algebraic geometry. Oh, quite a title. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the as well. Um, but what I want to talk about is uh, the program that, uh, well, that I have for, you know, for several years now, and uh, I think that. In general, uh, it should be a direction that, well, at least group, geometric group theories should, uh, should go also in these directions. Uh, geometry was very successful in group theory. I mean, in fact, it revolutionized the whole field, uh, mainly by Gromov, and from Gromov on. And um, there, there are nearby algebraic categories that uh, are just waiting for such a revolution. And uh, um, there's a lot to do in this direction. Um, for me, uh, it's also uh, low-dimensional topology was very successful in group theory. Of course, uh, uh, group theory was also successful in, in low-dimensional topology. That's another story. Uh, and uh, part of my talk today is to this conjecture, uh, but there are also some results. But I won't speak about results in this direction. That low-dimensional topology plays a role, a key role, uh, in well, what appears in the title in. in uh, in algebraic geometry over uh, non commutative rings. Um, okay, I'll, when I'll get to that, uh, I'll say more. Okay, so uh, that's another thing that I think that the uh, concept from low dimensional topology should play an essential role in certain questions in general in non commutative algebra. Uh, it will go on from, from ring theory, I think, also to other categories. But uh, there's a lot to do in this direction. Okay, so uh, so algebraic geometry uh, in general, okay, I won't talk about this at all, but, but uh, studies the set of solutions X, okay, let's say a tuple, uh, which is a solution to some polynomial with, with coefficients, okay, I won't write them. Um, <laughs> well, many say polynomials. But uh, with all the developments, even today, uh, in, in algebraic geometry, in algebraic revolution, that uh, in Puzzle, of course, it's a central branch of mathematics, um, still most of algebraic geometry deals with, uh, with fields or with commutative rings. So even with all the abstractions that appear there, somehow uh, non commutativity was, uh, was a real abstraction. And there, are, there is some uh, attempts to go from, uh, from community to. to um, the non commutative but it's usually you know, some twisted rings or something, and it's very close to uh, commutative. And what, what I want to look at is, is objects which are very far from commutative. For me, in order for a low dimensional topology to appear, you really need things which are very, very far from commutative. Okay, um, so what, what I'm going to talk about are, okay, I'll, I'll get to that, are uh, if they want to look at similar questions over, in a sense, the, the free object in the category of. Okay, non commutative not rings, but algebras. And this would be a free associative algebra, denoted like this. Okay, free associative non commutative. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe everybody saw, saw what, or know what it is, but, but let me just, you know, just one minute to say uh, what it is, and this will be important for me later. Okay, so we start with a, say, say we start with even a free group, okay, generated by K elements. Then the free semi-group, okay, which is just the po positive words in these elements. And what is the free associative algebra? Okay, in that respect, okay, so a general element U in FA will be a collection of elements, finite collection of elements from the free semi-group with coefficients from the field. So U will be summation on I with only but only finally many i's, the coefficient is non-zero, uh, fi, wi, where wi is an element from the free semigroup. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is the free associative algebra. Uh, okay, I think it's clear anyway, what's the, what's the operations there? Um, and we ask just a, just a similar question, okay, so we want to understand, well, it's not real, this is a question that was asked long before, I'll get to that. We want to understand what is the structure of a variety 
Okay, let, let me just uh, uh, okay. Let me just express that I look at polynomial, perhaps with coefficients. Um, we want to understand to say something about the the, the set of solution um, to um, to a system of polynomials um, over the. Uh, the free, the free associative algebra. So you see, the polynomial themselves, yeah, the polynomial themselves are elements in the free associative algebra, and we look also at the solutions. So these are just non-commutative polynomials, and the set of solutions. Oh, we look for solutions also in the free associative algebra, not necessarily in, in the same rank, in a different free associative algebra, but with the same field. Okay, uh, and solution of course just means that if we substitute them instead of the axes, uh, we get zero in this in this free associative algebra. This is precisely the analog of of algebraic uh, of of varieties over over a field or a community ring, just in the non-commutative set. So the parameters A are from where? I, I just denote A as the generators of this uh, oh. okay, the free semigroup, which are okay, the elements of degree one. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is this is not new. But, uh, Okay, this, this subject has a long history, at least in the sense that it started long ago. Um, so maybe it started before, but I mean, the, the person who really put it in, in the beginning is uh, P. M. Kohn, who had lot of, lot of, lot, has lots of works on this on this subject. I think the first one, okay, at least is around 1960, and uh, most of the advancement was whatever is known was. Uh, in the 60s, maybe, maybe the beginning of the 70s, um, but not not much not much is known. In fact, uh, if you look at the introduction of Kohn's book and also in reviews that were written, oh, I should say, Kohn has a okay. I, mean, I won't mention the, all this in detail, but Kohn has a book. George Bergman, who I'm going to mention in a few minutes, uh, who also one of the main contributors to this field, uh, also has a book on this field. Uh, but but uh, I think both of them mentioned in their introduction that. What they wanted to understand is precisely this thing, but they wished they, could, if they were even uh, willing to make any sort of guess as to what is the structure of this thing. So they were, now, they were not able even to make conjecture, and to some extent there is reason for that, but uh, I think they, they were expecting this is a completely wild subject, and what I'm going to explain, and I don't think so. It has a very rich structure. Okay, uh, okay so why, why is this? Why is this? Uh, why is it so problematic over non-commutative algebras comparing to commutative ones? Okay, you see, if, if you write, suppose this polynomial just contains two monomials. Okay, just even one polynomial doesn't matter, and you have isn't it, simplest equation equal to x j one equals x j m. You see, you have you have an element that is factored in one way, and here is an element that is factored in another way. And uh, you know, if, if you want to approach something like this, that an element of one side is equal to an element of another side, and it factors in two different ways, then you know, in order to be able to to approach the structure of such solutions, um, you would need some sort of unique factorization. This that would okay. You would like that something like this will exist in the object that you are looking at. And uh, in fact, this is the problem that Kohn and Bergman later tackled, and this is very problematic in the non commutative setup. So let me first uh, remind you, well, I'm sure everybody knows, but you know what happened in the commutative world. So if we know, if we work with the unique factorization domain, then you know, every element has a. Now I'm in the commutative world. Okay? Every element has a factorization into irreducible or prime factors. I already know the index I see by i, sorry, so it's not the same, but okay. Uh, and the, the, these irreducible or prime components are defined, up, well defined up to a product by unit. So, anyway, they are completely defined. And the question is what happens when you go to the non commutative world? And in the non commutative world, Cohn, PM Cohn, introduced the notion of a unique factorization domain like this. And well, one may ask, what is the analog of this thing? 
So indeed, there is an analog. If, if you factorize uh, the same element in two different ways, okay, so uh, it turns out that the number of, here they call it atoms for some reason, but anyway, the num number of the other of irreducible elements will be the same in, on the two sides. Um, however, you know, we cannot act with the permutation. If we change two elements, this is not commutative, we will get a different element. So this is not allowed. Um, but the question is to what extent the elements that appear on the two sides are unique. And uh, this is the name here. And okay, the, the, uh, the equivalence between the, the atoms on the both sides is much weaker. This is part of the main problem. And this is the following. Okay, we'll say that uh, two elements, ui and say u c mi, are what's called similar. Okay, if the models are, let's, if, if you work over a ring R, okay, R u i is isomorphic as an R model over this, uh, sorry, over u i, uh, sigma i. You know. This is supposed to be with an so this is this is the similarity condition. See, in the in the commutative case, this p is defined only after product with the unit. Here, you'll have to check whether these two models are whether these two models are isomorphic as R models. And you know, there is a there are all sorts of pathologies with this with this relation. Here is a kind of classical example, but you can construct much much nastier than this one. Uh, but this appears somehow in the books. Uh, but if you look at these elements, in the, the x and y are arbitrary elements in the free associative algebra. So it's possible to factorize this in two different ways one like this, mm -hmm. and the other one <coughs> is xy plus 1x. Mm -hmm. You see, by we believe this unique factorization thing, then uh, it means that yx plus 1 is similar to x, y plus 1. If you want, as an exercise, you can prove that the models are actually isomorphic as R models, or as when R is the, is the free associative algebra, it's true. But, you know, in order, in general, as I said, you can construct far nastier examples, and it's very, very difficult to check that elements are actually similar. And it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to continue working with these equations using this, uh, this similarity criteria. Well, the, the situation is even worse than that in some sense. Um, you know, okay, this is, this is the unique factorization, but you, you can fix now an element, say, u0 in the pre associative algebra, and look, okay, not just two factorization, but look at the, you know, think about the commutative case, you can look at the lattice of divisors of these elements. Okay, it has a structure of a lattice up to, up to the similarity. Uh, equivalence relation, and you see in the um, in the commutative world, if you look at lattice of divisor, right, you just need to specify what powers of each prime you're taking in the divisor. It means that this lattice is really a product of chain. There is a chain for each prime, and uh, a lattice of divisor will be just product of this chain. So let's say a cube in a d-dimensional space. Okay, all, all the lattice forms in a cube in a d-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what happened in the in the non-commutative world? So the first thing is, you know, this is a lattice, but the question is whether there is a GCD and LCM to every two elements. This is not always true in uh, what's called unique factorization domain, but in the free associative algebra it is true. So this is what's called distributive lattice, where you, for each two elements you have a wedge and a joint. So the question is, uh, what uh, distributive lattices can appear as the lattice of divisor of elements in the free associative algebras? And for this, there is a very nice uh, solution uh, due to George Bergman. And he showed just a universal statement, that the following, that for every uh, distributed finite distributed lattice, Okay, there exists an element u0 in a free associative algebra. It doesn't matter how many generators and what is the field, such that okay, this lattice is the lattice of the value. Okay, 
And I think, well, this theorem, the beautiful theorem on one hand, on the other hand, I think this was considered by people in the field as the, as the end of the story. Uh, in fact, I, I spoke with George Bergman on this subject because I wanted to know uh, what, what was known, even on a very specific question, and he always referred me just to this theorem, that was his answer. Uh, so, after, after such a theorem, it's really hard to expect that uh, there is anything. Kohn's yeah, book is, ends, in a sense, with this theorem, with Bergman's theorem. Um, I missed how this lattice is related to U0. Oh, you, you look at all the, all the divisors of U0. Well, this has a structure of a lattice. Yeah, the module is similar. Yeah, yeah up to similarity, yeah. And then the, the, what Bergman says is that every finite, every finite structure of lattice is a lattice of some element. And what is a divisor? A left divisor or a right divisor? Or? Oh, uh, <coughs> Yeah, there's some, some sort of, even though it doesn't look like it, there's some sort of, uh, uh, I mean, something that would be true for left. Yeah, I don't, okay, I don't want to answer uh, something which is wrong. It's, it's better to check. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not going to use it, this theorem of course, anymore. So, uh, yeah, you have to fix this up, but... Uh, it's, it's probably true for both sides. Yeah, one side. Yeah. Yeah, yes, All right. Uh, this is for free algebra over any field, or? Yeah, this is true for any over any field. Fixed field. Yeah, it also doesn't depend on the neural generators. It's Okay, so I want to move to a positive result. Negative results are less interesting in that sense. Um, so Bergman also is responsible to the, uh, in a way, to the only commutative, uh, only sorry, non-positive result uh, in this field. Um, and this is the following uh, theorem of Bergman. It's a well-known theorem, effective thesis. 1967. Um, this is also about the same year. Um, and what Bergman uh, answered uh, is the, fo in the following question. He, even this question is not, uh, is not easy. So uh, you fix u0 in the free associative algebra and look at the centralizer of this element. So the centralizer in the free group or the free semi group is something which is, you know, we are all very familiar with, it's very easy. But in a free associative algebra, even this is not, uh, is not obvious. So the centralizer of, of an element, okay, this is, you can look at it as a, as a variety that uh, just, okay, the, you can write it as the commutator equals zero, or write x u zero equal u zero x, <laughs> same thing. And, okay, well, what the answer is, what is the structure of the centralizer of an element? That's a non-trivial question, apparently. Um, and he has a complete answer, that's the theorem. So what, what he proved is that uh, there exists another element, T0, in FA, which can be viewed as some sort of generalized root of this element, in general. Okay, and uh, this, this, okay, this centralizer is equal to, it's really a polynomial in one, in, in one variable of this T0. T0, where, uh, okay, you, you go over all polynomials, in f of x. Okay, in the ring of polynomials in one variable. This is a complete classification of the uh, centralizer of an element. You see, in particular, it's commutative, um, but, it, but the generator is not the original element, but some sort of generator. Okay, this is, uh, this is Bergman theorem. And by, by the way, using this theorem, it's not very difficult to see that, uh, you know, lots of this pathology is because the centralizer is something that is defined on the first order uh, language, then lots of pathologies from uh, community algebra can be somehow inserted in, into the theory via this theorem. Um, however, this is a very important theorem if we want to go further. But, but this was more or less what was known. Okay, now 
we want still to, to go back to the question to understand the structure of these, uh, of these varieties. And I think uh, an important step towards that, still even far from this step, uh, there's a reason why this is an important step. I'm not going to, to get into that. But an important uh, class of varieties that, by the way, Bergman theorem, all the pathologies that, uh, you know, Bergman's theorem here as well, all the pathologies defined still apply to this, this particular class, so I'm not really cheating by, by uh, choosing some side, uh, side class or something that doesn't say anything in the general case. This is a, an important step towards understanding the whole thing is, uh, I'm calling monomial varieties, So this would just mean that I will assume that each polynomial contains just two elements. Okay, so it means that if it contains two elements, I can write it that one monomial is equal to another monomial. Uh, sorry, let's put it m one hat, etc. Until m s x a equals m s hat. Okay, this is a. I will regard this as a as a monomial variety. There's a, at least there are reasons to believe that if this is well understood, then it will be possible to, at least to go towards the, the general case, but, uh, but even this case is still far from being understood. So I want to look at uh, you know this uh, this monomial varieties in a slightly different perspective. I'm going to use geometry or combinatorics to study that. Uh, so you know we just look at the same thing. It's, it's really a, it's a, just a different perspective. It's not I'm not changing anything in the problem. Um, okay, so here we have. Uh, we have monomials, and the monomials, okay, each monomial is, say, xi1, xi2, etc. Some of them may be coefficients, doesn't matter, they're equal to the other side. And each of these elements, if you think of the, if you think of the solution, then the solution, okay, is an element in the free associative algebra. Now, the free associative algebra, okay, it was erased already, but uh, the free associative algebra, right, is a collection of uh, monomials with coefficients, but, but each monomial is an element in the, uh, in the free semigroup. Now, the free semigroup has a, has a k-graph, okay, like the group, which is a tree, the rooted tree. Mm -hmm. And, well, we have a collection of monomials with coefficients from the group. Okay, I'm going to look at the case where you said there will not be coefficients. But, um, but just think of the monomials themselves. It means that each, with each element, after I think of this as a solution with each element here, one can associate a finite tree, a finite subtree of the k-graph of the semigroup. Okay, so let me draw this. Okay, so with each element here, I associate some sort of tree. Okay, this is the collection of monomials that appear in this element. Now the problem is that some monomials may be the prefixes of others. Okay, so I just denote now by red, Okay, all the ends of all the roots of, of uh, the elements that I'm taking, so some of them may be also interior. Okay, so this is this is an element. I think of the, of the free, an element in the free associative algebra as such element. Okay, so as a tree with this uh, with these red dots that uh, that indicate the end of of uh, monomials. And now you know. There are problems here that are coming from commutative algebra just to prevent that. Anyway, I'm just interested in the, 
you know, to understand this structure, I'm just interested in the general conceptual understanding, and then want to, to I want to isolate as much as possible problems from primitive algebra. So I always assume from now on that my field of coefficient is just F2. Okay, just two elements. So what's important for me when I'm talking about an element is just the support of this element. Okay, there are no coefficients anymore. Coefficient one or zero, that's one. Okay, and then later on. Yeah, you can probably generalize that. But but uh, but at the moment we just take field with, with two elements. Okay, so that, that's how an element we can think of, of this element like this, and you know the next element will be also something like that, etc. And when we think about the monomial, it's just a concatenation of tricks. Okay, we take the second tree, put it in each of the red vertices, look at the concatenation of them. I mean, maybe the same. The same product, the same monomial will appear you know, several times. We have to edit and take it because we, the field has the field has only two elements. We have to, to look at it mod two, the number of appearances, and the same thing okay, on the other side. And we want to analyze this. Okay, what uh, what happened in this case? Um, okay, if you really. You know, what, what happens here is that we, we need to develop tools to understand the distributing law uh, in the free associative algebra for, for this monomial variety. And of course, the distributive law is precisely a law that doesn't exist in groups. Okay, so we need somehow tools to study combinatorially and geometrically the distributive law. And okay, I'm going to probably refer to that several times uh, in the time that remains. Okay. Um, what can be said now about what, what can be said about about this uh, concatenation of tricks? Okay, so the first thing is we can look at the top homogeneous element or top homogeneous part. Let's call it. Okay, so I'm going to look only on this monomial uh, in each of the trees, each of the elements that have the highest degree. Okay, this is a this is a homogeneous element. And if, if there are coefficients here also, I'm going to take just the, just the top homogeneous part. And what we get, if we look just at the top homogeneous part, okay, what, what we get is a homogeneous equation. And, okay, we, we were looking for the homogeneous element. So if we look at homogeneous equation and we look for homogeneous solutions. And not just the equation uh, is homogeneous in the sense that in the sense that all coefficients are homogeneous, but we also want to, to understand what are the homogeneous solutions to this homogeneous equation. Okay, we just look at the top homogeneous part. And for this, luckily for this, uh, for this thing, just looking for homogeneous solution of homogeneous equations, there is a complete answer. Okay, why there is, homo why there is a complete answer? Because uh, you know, one can ask the same type of question, you see, if you... Yeah, you know, this is very similar if you write equations like this and things are homogeneous. This is very similar to what happened in semi groups. Um, and in semi groups, one can, well, you can ask what's, what's the set of solutions to system of equations in semi group. So this was open for a long time. Actually, it was, uh, it was first solved by, so I don't know who pronounced this Polish name. You probably yes. know. Yes. Yes, okay. So uh, he saw it in 2013 or 14. Um, and I think Lars Jovanis is going to speak about related things, how to encode the, the, the solution in terms of the language. But uh, actually, I'm interested more in a geometric description. And uh, what I did, in some sense, as a preparation for this work is to exactly understand the set of solutions to system of equations uh, over a semi, over a free semi group, but from a geometric point of view. And the theorem that applies here, okay, that comes basically, this is really now, it's really an observation that, uh, that the construction that, that works over the semi group actually works here as well for analyzing the uh, homogeneous solution to homogeneous equation. And this is that there exists uh, a mechanical borough diagram. Diagram that encodes all homogeneous solutions. Homogeneous 
these questions. So this is, this is in a sense well understood, I and mean, it's understood to the extent that, um, that uh, the solutions to a uh, system of equation over semigroups are understood. Um, and let me just, I'm, I'm not going to say much about, about this diagram. Uh, it's a modification of the diagram over groups. Um, but the, the way it was constructed, um, the way conceptually the, 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 the key, that, oh, I see it, although it wasn't done like this historically, the key to understand the set of solutions to equations of a group is using the JJ composition. And what I did in order to construct this diagram is somehow to take the machine that construct the JJ of the groups and modify it to work of the seven groups. This is much more complicated technically, but it is possible. Uh, and this gives, uh, this, gives this, this diagram, even though it doesn't give a JSJ decomposition, it's still open question whether there is a JSJ decomposition in this context of a semi group. But okay, this is out of my, of my talk today. Um, right, so why, why is this at least a key to, uh, to go back to, to, to uh, understanding uh, monomial, monomial varieties in general? even in the non-homogeneous case. So, let me make uh, a short bit of time, but, um, but let me make just a couple of minutes, um, you know, I'll, I'll just make brief uh, remarks that uh, try to connect these things to logic, and I don't know how to connect them to logic, um, but, but you know, logic gave hope, at least in the beginning. I, I really don't know how to technically connect it. But there are two, okay, there are two properties that are somehow that come from free groups that one can expect it will help here. Again, we don't know how, how they help. But, uh, okay, so the first thing is uh, what is true. Okay, I, I won't explain these things. It will be just remarks to the model theories. So uh, equationality of the affinity sets. This is true of a free group. Okay, it's quite difficult to prove of a free group, but it's true. And if you think about the equation in rings, you know, if you look at it here, okay, each monomial participates in many equations, uh, but, but the scheme of the equation is the same as what one might hope, one might hope that equationality will, will somehow help. But the, the problem with that is that uh, it's somehow a mistake to treat each monomial separately. You have to work with them together and it doesn't uh, it doesn't help much which I don't know and the other thing uh, which has some influence here is superstability so the superstability um, you know, the theory of free group is stable but not super stable uh, but super stable formulas at least conjecturally have uh, much nicer geometric properties and this concept, uh, the geometric properties are somehow helpful also when you go here. Okay, I'm not going to explain that, but, uh, but it has some connection. That's also true by the percent groups. I mean, this, this concept of superstability. Although it's not directly, I don't know how to directly relate the notion of superstability in these things, but somehow it appears. Okay, now, um, okay, I'll, I'll go back. Okay, I'll go back to the, okay, we'll, we'll leave model theory. And, uh, and go back to this theorem and to understanding monom monomial varieties in the non-homogeneous case. So the conjecture that I won't get uh, much into detail, you know, to, to really state it, it's much more technical, uh, but, but the conjecture is that uh, there exists a mechanical borrow diagram that encodes All solutions. All solutions meaning now also non-homogeneous. The monomial system. Monomial system of equations. Okay, as I said, I'm, I mean to, to understand or to get to this structure, one has to go first in, through semi-group and then. Uh, making uh, making more precise this conjecture. Uh, this is by far still a conjecture, but one can at least under some conditions. 
one can one can prove parts of it. Talk about some. Yeah. Okay. People have time to talk about some results towards this special case of this conjecture. But before that, let me. This will be also a, a remark. I didn't say the conjecture, but I want to think there are even um, there are interesting um, concept just in stating this conjecture uh, properly. Um, and this is the following. Uh, in, in, in order to encode all solutions over a group, okay, to construct a mechanical world di diagram over a group, one needs the group to have lots of automorphisms. Okay, so that if we have, you know, the concept is that if we have a homomorphism from a group into a free group, okay, we can always twist it by precomposing the homomorphism with an automorphism of these groups. And indeed, limit groups that appear here have lots of automorphisms even a geometric automorphism that is somehow encoded by the JSJ, the composition of this group. Okay, so in groups, the JSJ somehow gives it. Um, if one goes to semi-group, so a semi-group, unlike a group, usually will have very few automorphisms. Think about a free semi-group. Every generator but under an automorphism must go to another, another generator. Mm -hmm. So you can have at most finitely many automorphisms. This is not enough to waste homomorphism and somehow make the collection simpler. So you want automorphisms, and even if you look at server papers and equations over semigroups from the past, you'll see that they always indicate this as one of the major problems. And it's possible to, uh, to overcome this problem by not like looking at the semigroup, but somehow the semigroups in question are embedded into groups, actually embedded in this case into a limit group. Now the limit group can have lots of automorphisms, and these automorphisms do not preserve the image of S, but they act on the embedding of the semigroup inside the limit group. So it's possible to somehow use the automorphism of this limit group, that are encoded by something like the JSJ of this, I, I view it as the JSJ of this pair, okay, to twist homomorphisms. Here the, the map is into at this scale. You know, this is the positive cone inside the free group. Okay, so here the, the automorphism come from the from the from the linear group. In the case of uh, algebras, this is more complicated. Uh, so the question is where to get automorphism, so the automorphism that one needs in order to twist homomorphism. And okay, this is still a conjectural picture, but I'm pretty sure that one way or another it's true. Uh, that if we have an algebra, what we'll have here is a division algebra that contains this algebra, somehow factorial. And the algebra may not have uh, the automorphism that we need, but the division algebra will have. Okay, and uh, this, again, the automorphism of the division algebra, just like the automorphism of the limit group, will act on the abandoning of this algebra inside the division algebra. See, uh, in the theory of uh, equations of groups and semigroups, what plays an essential role, again, as I see it, is because of the JSJ, which is a conceptual reason for that. What plays an essential role are surfaces. Function surface, it doesn't matter. Here, what will play the essential role is uh, a surface algebra or a quadratic algebra. Okay, I don't know yet how to call this thing. Okay, something similar to surface in the context of algebras. And the group of automorphisms of a surface okay, is the mapping class group. So, what we will get here is an analog, an extension really, of the mapping class group to the context of this surface algebra. This will be a group of automorphisms of a division algebra that is associated with, with the surface algebra. Okay, in some sense, it's like what, what Alex mentioned, what, what, uh, what is done in algebraic right geometry. Then you, you go to the profinite extension. Here, one has to go to some division algebra that contains the, contain the algebra, okay, something that you know, the moment I tended to call the Bergman metric class group, of a surface algebra. Okay, this probably is uh, a 
group it. It's countable, but not finitely generated, and contain the mapping class group in a, in a natural way. Okay. It's not supposed to be factorially defined. So it's not the group ring of the mapping class group? What? Or, or, so is it going to be no, no. Really no, 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 no. It's not no, no. trivial. <laughs> but for every such A, you will get a different one? Yeah, for, yeah. But this is, you know, not, not for every ring. Not for every ring, it's possible to define a division algebra. But for the ring, some kind of limit algebra that appear in this construction. Yeah, for every A, you'll, you'll define it. And you'll, you'll but some of the surprising thing that in the group theory, it was the same class of surface group and mapping class group, which played the role. Yeah, no, here also. No, no, but also here. For each algebra, okay, for each algebra, there will be such a division algebra, conjecturally. But, uh, but, but still, surfaces somehow play an essential role there. Okay, it's uh, like limit groups, right? Limit groups, you know, there are many limit groups, but still, surfaces somehow, surfaces and centralizer play an essential role in their. In there are the models. Okay, we, we can let me have a little room. So I just want to discuss some cases where I actually know the proof answers. Okay, so uh, okay, so yeah, still have okay. I have this conjecture. Um, okay, because because we understand the the homogeneous part. Okay, we can talk about special cases of this conjecture, namely. We can, uh, we can uh, look at cases for which the corresponding diagram over a semigroup, right? The, the diagram, if we think just of the, of the homogeneous top part, this, as I said, corresponds to, a, to an equation or system of equations over a semigroup. And this will have a mechanical borough diagram. Because over a semigroup, there is a mechanical borough diagram. OK, so we can look at properties that this diagram has and try to analyze just these cases. And that's how we can separate cases. So the, the case that. I started actually to work on this on surfaces, but I realized that I first need to really understand what happens when there are no surfaces. Okay, when the diagram of the semigroup doesn't have surfaces. And the whole the whole strategy here, this is strategy that I have, I, I should say that I don't, you know, I, I somehow taught myself how to make conjectures. I even I can even prove some results over that, but I really don't understand why the proofs work. In a very strange situation, but the proofs do work. Um, it's a, it's a different thing to prove something and to understand uh, why it works. Um, okay, so, uh, so so what I'm getting close to is to prove this conjecture when when there are no surfaces, uh, and let me let me give some results. Okay, I don't know. I really have two minutes, but I'll try to. Uh, so the first theorem. Okay, looks close to what Bergman actually did. Um, and this is the following. Okay, suppose you, you take now u0 and v0 elements in the free associative algebra, and you look at those elements in the free associative algebra for which uh, u0x <laughs> equal x v0. Okay, in the case of Bergman, these two elements are the same. Uh, so you, know, you can think of x as some sort of formal conjugator between u0 and v0. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is that Bergman proof is, is really theoretic, and it's not at all clear how to push it to any other case. But I asked Bergman, even on this specific question, he didn't have a clue how to do that using these techniques. And he did. Green theorists uh, didn't make any progress um, to, to any other class. But it's possible here to give a complete, uh, a complete answer. So I think it, the answer is that there exists an element uh, in the free associative algebra, sort of the shortest solution. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that this thing is equal to W0, P of V, P, I don't know, V0, no? P, V0. Okay, where, where again, P of T, P of X, P of T, whatever, mm -hmm. is in uh, the general phenomenon. So this is a shifted algebra, like in Bergman. Okay, in Bergman case, you take W0 equal 1. I should say that. In Bergman theorem, one has to go to a generalized root. And to prevent this, I just assume that these guys don't have, the top part doesn't have, here. This, it doesn't matter, this is a technical condition just to make my life a little easier. But, uh, but, but one can stay in such a theorem also in, in the general case. Um, so this is, this is the first thing. Here's another 
theorem in, in this. And I should say, I mean, this gets, okay, the last theorem, I probably won't have time to state it, okay, we already deal with the general uh, monomial equation with only one variable. If you look also historically what happened with, with uh, the system of equations over a free group, okay, this was the first step. Okay, to deal with the uh, with system of equation with one variable, and the techniques that are developed to deal with equation with one variable will actually, this I suppose so, will allow me to, to prove this conjecture when there are no surfaces. So here is, okay, I'll give another uh, example. Each such step, okay, the proof is, this is not short, I don't know if difficult, but not short. Okay, you take u1, u2, v1, and v2, and look at the equation. Uh, u1x, u2, we call it v1x, v2. Okay, so it turns out that if, if there exists uh, a long enough solution, long enough solution just means, okay, I should say long enough, but it means that the degree of the solution is uh, somehow the, maybe twice the, the summation of the degree of these guys. Okay, that's long enough. It's bigger than some constant times the, the length. I think twice is enough. Uh, then, if there, if there exists such a long solution, then there exist S zeros and T zeros such that this set is just equal to the solution of the previous equation. Uh, oh, I just denoted by S and T. Okay, so again, the, the set of solution is like, you know, it's a twisted Bergman. Uh, set of solutions. And <coughs> the next step is to go to uh, you know, a general equation with one variable. Yeah, I'm sorry. I okay, that, that means uh, you look at the equation u1x, u2x, x un equal v1x, v2x, uh, the end, the end. And also here, if there is a long enough solution to this equation, and again, long enough is just a constant time the summation of the degrees of the, of the coefficients. So if there is a long enough solution, then there will exist such two elements so that the set of solution is like that. Actually, all long solutions will be like this. All solutions from one, from one, from a certain degree and on will be in this set. And there may be some sporadic short solution. But uh, anyway, we, we can ignore the, the sporadic so solution. The other ones do all fall uh, into here. And at least, okay, I'm still in the process of writing this. And, though, and going on, and I, I suspect that the, the techniques to analyze the solution of this equation, as I said, will, uh, will lead to the solution, to, to a proof of this conjecture if there are no surfaces. For surfaces, one needs more. And, it's a rather long story. Probably will take a long time. Okay, let this go here. You said before about the division algebra. Uh -huh. and, you know, what's, what's the similarity of the surfaces and how is it built? Okay, so, uh, yeah, this thing. So this thing is still in the situation of a conjecture, okay? All right, but, uh, right, but, okay, a surface algebra, an example of a surface algebra, I won't define it now in general, but, uh, but an example of a surface algebra is, uh, you know, is, is the following, okay? So you, you have uh, x1 to xn, let's say, with, uh, with, the, with just a single equation, Okay, for some for some permutations sigma in Sn, we need some irreducibility properties of this permutation. But okay, this is yeah. This would be an example of a surface algebra. It's more than that, but, but this would be an example of a surface algebra. And my conjecture is that, uh, that this surface algebra can be embedded inside uh, some division algebra. Which, which okay, I haven't constructed that, but but uh, the construction should be something. That uh, you know, there are several constructions of division algebra that contain the free associative algebra, like Manchel Neumann and Mitsuha's constructions. Uh, and 
Okay. The aim is to construct something like this in this context, and then in a more general context. I haven't done that. And there are also general criteria, but you're not interested in, in that approach. I mean, someone has a general criteria for embedding into the division algebra. But you want something concrete. I want something concrete, yeah. yeah. I think here it should be concrete. Questions? No? Alright, so we resume in 10 minutes and let's thank Phil for the